most of the time what holds you back from really understanding music theory and using that knowledge to take one idea from one chord to the next is something that's actually really simple. When we're working with music theory and when we're trying to take ideas and understand them, then you need to think about the notes that you're playing in different layers. And that means that you need to know what notes are in the scale, you need to know what notes are in the chord, and also what are the notes that you're using if you're using an arpeggio in a solo or in the voicing that you're using to play that part of the song. If you use a B minor pentatonic scale on a C major 7 chord, then you can think of it as just being those two things. If you're thinking on that level, then you have your C major 7 chord and you have your B minor pentatonic scale and through some sort of trick or some sort of magic, then those two together probably works. The problem is that if you're thinking about it like that, then you don't really know if what you're going to play is going to work. It's a little bit random whether your solo is going to sound good. So just knowing a little bit more about how those two are connected is going to help you a lot in playing something that actually works. And so it's not random whether it sounds good. My name is Jens Larsen learn jazz, make music. This really ties into how I talk about learning the fretboard as well, because I think it's important that you learn the notes on the fretboard in the groups of notes that you need when you're making music. That means learning that in the scales that you're using or the arpeggios. And it's also important to be really at home in seeing how all these things tie together and how they fit together, because that's something that you can use to understand what's going on in the music, understand the chord progression, and in this video, I'm going to talk about how you can use this way of thinking to improve your solos by coming up with some new ideas and just understanding everything that's happening in the piece of music you're playing. You probably know and use this already. If you're improvising over a D minor seven chord, then you can use the D minor seven arpeggio, but you can also use the arpeggio from the third of the chord. And in this case, the third of the chord is an F and the arpeggio that you have there if you're improvising in a C major context is an F major 7. So that means that if you want to figure that out for any chord, you need to know what the third of the chord is. So you need to know the notes within that chord, so the notes of the arpeggio, and you also need to know the scale that you're using at that time and what the diatonic arpeggio from the third of the chord is. So those kind of things need to tie together for you to have that option, to realize whether it's an F major 7 and whether you can use it in this context. If you know the notes of a D minor 7 and an F major 7 arpeggio, then you also know how to relate the F major 7 arpeggio to the D minor root. And that's really important because you want to know what those notes sound like on top of a D minor chord. That's something that you need when you're improvising with it. So you need to know that the first note is a third, and then the fifth, the seventh, and the ninth. And that they sound like... You can also look at this coming from the other side. Let's say that you're transcribing a Michael Brecker solo and he's using a C sus 4 triad on a D minor chord. So of course first you need to know what notes are in a C sus 4 triad to recognize that that's actually a C sus 4 triad. And then you need to figure out why this works. And the easiest way to do that is just to take those notes and then relate them to a D minor root. So in this case that means that we have the C that's the 7th, the F is the 3rd and the G is the 11th. So we have this sound, which is kind of like a D minor 11 sound. Once you know what triad this is, then you can also use that to not only play the lick that Michael Brecker is playing, but also start making inversions, using the same arpeggio in other things. And that way it opens up a lot of options. And you kind of know that it's going to work because this is what it sounds like. The next thing you can do is of course to take this to other chords. So you can look at it and say, well, he's building a sus4 triad from the seventh of the chord. If I do this from other chords, what am I going to get? And if you start working with this, then you're gonna find that you're gonna come across what Rick Beato calls a Lydian triad, I think, which is like a sus sharp four. And you can also find what is really Joe Henderson's sort of opening motif of inner urge, which is like a diminished sus4 triad. Things that you may not come across if you don't start working and thinking like this, but which you can really make great music with. Another place where you often just use a shortcut is when you're superimposing pentatonics onto chords. And of course, if you like to work out vocabulary by just taking a chord and a pentatonic scale and then 
seeing what that sounds like and experimenting and coming up with vocabulary in that way, then there's nothing wrong with that. That's always a good idea to do. At the same time, it can also really pay off to just look at, well, what is exactly happening here and why does some things work better than others? If we take the example of the B minor pentatonic scale over a C major seven chord that I talked about in the beginning, it really makes sense to know what notes are in the B minor pentatonic scale and how do they relate to a C major seven chord. So if we take a look at the notes, so that's B, D, E, F sharp and A. And if you relate it to a C major seven, then it's the major seven, the ninth, the third, sharp 11, and the 13. The way you use this information is that if you play a phrase with the B minor pentatonic scale, and when the phrase ends, it doesn't really sound sort of home enough, it doesn't really connect with the chord, then probably you wanna see if you can make, play a phrase that really ends on one of the strong notes in the chord. So in this case, that would be an E or a B that really sort of spells out that C major seven sound and are also in the minor pentatonic scale. And at the same time, you can also use this to really emphasize the Lydian sound that's included in this pentatonic scale by trying to emphasize or target the F sharp, which is the sharp 11 when you're playing a phrase and that way really get that sound across. So this is really about just having more options and being able to choose how your solo sounds. When you're improvising, then no matter what two chords you're playing over in the progression, you want to understand what is happening when you move from one chord to the next. This is really useful information. It's also gonna tell you a lot about how to solo over it, which kind of voicing you wanna choose and how you wanna go from one bar to the next in a logical way. Let's say we're playing a solo over an F minor six to C major seven progression, which is a basic four minor to one in C major, so. This progression. The most important part of understanding a chord progression like this is to understand what notes are in the chords and how they move. So you wanna know that we have F, A flat, C and D on the F minor six, and we have C, E, G and B on the C major seven. And then you also wanna figure out and be able to realize what notes are in the chords and how do they move from one to the next. So you wanna understand, and this is really the basic part of all voice leading. You wanna figure out how one chord moves to the next and which note in this chord moves to which note in the next chord. And this is really important because it's gonna help you get voicings that sound better. And it's also gonna help you figure out what notes to target when you're soloing so that you can really make the sound of the chord change clear. Another very basic thing that you can notice with this is that if you can see some notes that are in the second chord but not in the first chord, then very often they will make really good targets because then when you play those notes, you can really hear that the chord is changing. So in this case, that means that actually most of the notes in the second chord are easy to target because the C is in both chords, but the E, the G and the B are only in the C major seven. So if you're playing a line from the F minor six and then ending on an E, a G and a B, then you can hear that the chord is changing quite clearly. It's a very logical way to move from one chord to the next. And that's something you wanna be aware of when you're soloing. All of this thinking is of course not something you should be doing when you're soloing. This is something that you do to program your brain and internalize before you start soloing and then hopefully it's going to come out by itself when you're playing because you already make the connections. So this is something that you can actually work on even without an instrument. You can do this on the bus or in the train thinking about what notes are in there and what notes are in these different chords in this song or what are the different uh, diatonic chords in this scale. Stuff like that is really useful just to have an idea about what is going on and really connecting different islands of information. This is also why I'm often talking about doing exercises where you're working on diatonic arpeggios or diatonic triads, because in that way you sort of have the larger context, which is a scale, and then you have all the small arpeggios that are found within that scale, because there you're already connecting them to something where you might be using them. It's quite likely that if you already practiced your C major scale in diatonic seventh chords, that you can play both a D minor seven and an F major seven arpeggio. And you need both of them if you're coming across a two chord in a two, five, one in C. If you want to check out some more ideas and some more exercises for how I think about learning the different notes and practicing scales to learn the fretboard and having an overview of your instrument, but also of all the things that you need when you're improvising, then check out this short playlist where I have a few videos on that topic. Thank you for watching.